breaking down all the plays and getting you in the action. We've got you covered all season long. Welcome to the BCSN Nation podcast powered by Marco's Pizza. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the BCSN Nation podcast. I am your host, Justin Feldkamp. Alongside our guest analyst today would be Matt Kriegel. We are looking forward to episode 12 each and every Wednesday at 3 o'clock. The new podcast here from BCSN drops on your favorite place to get podcasts, whether that be on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and at our website, bcsnnation.com. That .com, bcsnnation.com, your source for all the highlights, all the stories, everything from Sports Nightly and all different types of clips and scores, your new home for all kinds of Northwest Ohio and Southeast Michigan high school and college sports. All right, Matt, we had Round one of the postseason in Ohio, 448 teams alive. What's 448 divided by two? 224. Attaboy! You're one for one. You didn't know math was involved. Didn't even have to take my shoes off. (laughs) Uh, So that is how many teams we have left here in the second round. This is technically the regional quarterfinal round, and we still have several area teams in Northwest Ohio and Southeast Michigan. It's called the District Finals up in Southeast Michigan. So we got Bedford and Whiteford. We'll get to those teams coming up in a little bit. But anything surprise you? Any takeaways from the first round, Matt? No, I, I think you especially like those 8-9 kind of matchups with Whitmer. Those are always a tough one, a tough one to pick. But I, I think from there, everybody kind of fell into place where you thought they would. And, and now's where, you know, Pat and I have talked about over and over again, it should be eight teams from each region. Yep. Now you're kind of whittled down to that, and you get some really good teams, really good matchups from here on in. All right, let's start it off. We're just going to go right down the list. We're going to start in Division One, go all the way through Division Seven, and then talk about Bedford and Whiteford in Michigan. So the team's still alive. We saw Whitmer go down to – uh, Olentangy Liberty. Uh, Perrysburg did advance, so they'd take on another Olentangy team. That'd be Olentangy Berlin. So Perrysburg, as the four seed, gets another home game. We were at Perrysburg at Steinecker Stadium for the tailgate show and for the game of the week on BCSN. You were there for the duration of that game against Finley. Perrysburg edged out Finley 17-14. to What'd you see in that game? I think Finley, you know, having a chance to play Perrysburg earlier in the season, grew up a little bit, figured out what they were good at, and and had a really good plan going into it against Perrysburg. Um, and I, I don't think Perrysburg executed quite as well as they have all season. They've played really clean offensive football, meaning, you know, they've taken advantage almost every drive going down and scoring. Um, they haven't turned the ball over in the other team's red zone much. And those are some of the things that they didn't do well in this game. Um, things like punting and kicking, when it comes down to cold weather, that makes a difference. And you can kind of see that with Perrysburg, and especially in the first half of that game, that you know the, those were some things that hurt them a little bit with field position. After the game, Coach Dirk Connor said, at this point, big boy football, D1 football, you find a way to survive, you find a way to advance, and they did just that. Yep. With this Olentangy Berlin team coming in, relatively new school uh, to this Division One landscape, they're going to be coming to Perrysburg. It's going to be a pretty formidable challenge, I'd imagine. Yeah, a little bit I've seen uh, with them. Uh, they have an excellent quarterback. Um, you, talking with some of the, the coaches on Perrysburg staff, if you remember Trevor Hafner at Perrysburg, kind of reminds them of Trevor Hafner. Throws well and runs well. Um, you know, Really good spread offense quarterback, and they appear to be really good defensively. So, um, yeah, the really tough draw for Perrysburg this week. Both of these teams, Berlin and Perrysburg, have played Dublin Jerome. Both of them lost to Dublin Jerome. Perrysburg lost by three points. Berlin lost to him by 10 points. So when you have that common opponent in there, it kind of gives you a little bit of an indication of how this one could play out. And based on that, it should be a very close game. Yeah, it just, you know, on first glance, and again, I don't get a whole lot of time to watch them. They, they seem to be very similar teams as far as makeup and that should be a great football game all right d2 now we had a couple area teams 
uh, still alive in this bracket. 16 teams in this region. Six area teams were in this region originally, and now we are down to just two. Anthony Wayne and Central Catholic advancing. So Anthony Wayne is going to take on Olmstead Falls. Olmstead Falls knocked off St. John's last week, so we almost had a St. John's Anthony Wayne rematch, but Anthony Wayne was down 13 nothing. Matt in the third quarter, continued to feed the ball to Joe Caswell, and he came through in the clutch, got two touchdown runs for them. They edged out a win 21 to 16, if memory serves me correctly, and then Olmstead Falls just took it to St. John's. Uh, there were a lot of offense in that game on both sides of the ball, but 42 to 14, 42 to 41. Ottawa Hill or Ottawa Falls, had, or excuse me, Olmstead Falls had 42 points at halftime, and they are a dominant run team. So this is going to be an interesting top-notch offense for Olmstead Falls against a top-notch defense for a dub. Yeah, Olmstead Falls is a, from what I understand, they're a flex bone team, and they've got three running backs and a quarterback who can really play. If obviously that's not something you see every week, um, Anthony Wayne saw it with Bowling Green earlier this season. So you've got a week to put together a defensive package and get ready to defend that. And, and Anthony Wayne does what they've done well the whole season, and, and it's really interesting to see an experienced head coach like Andy stick with his plan after you're down and, and things are getting kind of tough. Just kept feeding the ball to Caswell, and that's what wins them football games. That and really good defense. Yep, and that has worked so far. They're ten and one on the season, so that will be the site. We will be at Anthony Wayne for our BCSN Game Day Tailgate Show, along with the two of us and Pat Cacciardo. So we'll see you there at six thirty on Friday night, and that will be one of our selected uh, games that we will have on the BCSN Now app. So we're looking forward to that matchup to see if Anthony Wayne can advance and go on a run like they did in 2016, Andy Brungard's first year. Another matchup in D2, Central Catholic taking on Avon Lake. These two have playoff history uh, prior to this season. Central Catholic was knocked off two years ago, so the seniors on this Central Catholic team played as sophomores and lost on their own field 16-14 to against Avon Lake. Avon Lake beat Southview last week. Southview's great season, 8-3, and three, came to a close. They lost 26 to nothing. So Avon Lake advances to face Central, and Central dominated their first-round opponent in Ashland. So what do you see in this matchup, Matt? I, I think Central's going to continue to roll. Um, I, Avon Lake, year in and year out, is a really good Cleveland-area team. Um, a, a big rivalry between Avon Lake and Avon, who's always, you know, right up there as one of the top Division II teams in the state. Yep. And uh, Avon Lake had a really good season. They're 8-2, and 9-2 and two now. Um, you know, shut out Southview, so they're obviously really good defensively. Yep. But Central shows week in and week out that they can put up big points on teams that are really good defensively. You know, they, they've done it to Whitmer. They've done it to Fremont Ross. They've done it to all those really good teams in the track, and I expect Central to do that this week. Yeah, Coach Dempsey was telling me on Monday when I went over to practice to do an interview with him just how they're just a tradition-rich program, and when you have that, you kind of have the tried-and-true staples of success. They're going to be solid in all three phases, and that is the type of team that they have met over the course of Dempsey's two-decade tenure there at Central Catholic. He said that stuff that Avon Lake was doing 15 and 20 years ago is still what they're doing now. Yeah, and when you've got a good program, there, there's no reason to get away from your core of, of what you're really good at. Um, guys like Greg Dempsey adjust to the type of personnel that they have, and he's done that with this football team. Um, you know, He's adjusted his offensive and de offense and defense to the kind of athletes they have, and, and the thing – you notice about Central, year in and year out, they play mistake-free football. They just make you make you play mistake-free football against them. That's what makes them tough. And a reminder, these games, second-round games, are at the Higher Seeds home site next week in the third round. The regional semifinals is when we go to neutral site locations. All right, you're watching and listening to the BCSN Nation podcast here on BCSN, I'm Justin Feldkamp alongside Matt Kriegel. We are presented and powered by Marco's Pizza. Shout out to our sponsor, Marco's Pizza. Glad to have them 
on board. All right, let's go from Division Two to Division Three, Matt. Not a ton of area teams in this one. We got extended BCSN footprint teams. Defiance pulled an upset. They were the 13 seed, knocked off Cloverleaf in a blowout. So Defiance is moving on. We saw Scott's season come to a close, losing to Lutheran West. We still have the two seed Tiffin Columbian alive and the three seed Clyde alive. So when you see teams like Clyde, Tiffin Columbian, Defiance, anything pop into your mind there, Kriegel? Uh, uh, all three have been really good this season. I think that Defiance sticks out. Um, you know, on paper, Cloverleaf was a really good football team, and you don't see many blowouts, especially the lower seed blow out the higher seed in the state playoffs. So I'm sure they've got some attention. And Tiffin and Columbian have been really good all season. So those are three teams that you know you'd expect to have a chance to move on this week. Yeah, Columbian and Clyde, two programs that I know with the current coaching staff have always push the envelope when it comes to non-conference scheduling and playing tough teams to prepare them for potential playoff runs like this. So good luck to all the D3 teams in our area. D3 to D4 now. We got Bellevue. We have Perkins uh, still alive. And we've been talking about Perkins a little bit here on the podcast and on uh, our game day tailgate show a little bit. The Pirates with Logan Lesh. Uh, they've done extremely well this season, been in the top 10 state rankings for about half of the season. They earned the three seed with a 9-1 regular season record. They easily beat River Valley last week, so now they're taking on Van Wert. If you remember a couple years ago, Van Wert ended up winning the state championship. So uh, Perkins and Van Wert in this matchup, a game that you can see live on the BCSN Now app. I'm looking forward to this matchup. Yeah, Van Wert beat a really good Wauseon team and beat them pretty well And you know, Perkins has blown out a lot of people this week, and so that 65 to 14, that's something they've done the whole season. Um, you, know, you, you talk about a tough one to pick. That's going to be a really good football team, two po teams that can put up some points and play really good defense. All right, so we'll see if Perkins can advance. We would like you guys to to keep us uh, on the road with you guys in the postseason as we continue with our BCSN Erie broadcast as well. Bellevue also in that. Bracket, they were a one seed, if you remember last year, got upset in the first round to a 16 seed Edison. They avenged for that. They're an eight seed this year. Bellevue won their first round game against Galleon. Now they get Cleveland Glenville, the number one ranked team in the state of Ohio, coached by Tengid Sr. Uh, Bellevue is one of those teams that year in and year out there in the playoffs, they've got a coach that, man, I can't tell you how many times he's been there. I bet somewhere in the 20s. He's got experience. I don't think they'll shy away from Glenville at all. I've got some experience with Glenville. You can get a little bit shell-shocked when they come walking off the bus. They look like a college team, but I'm sure Bellevue's one of those teams that has been there, done that, and they're going to step up and play. All right, to Division 5 now. This is the region that is loaded with Northwest Ohio flavor uh, up and down the bracket. So with eight teams remaining, we got Liberty Center taking on Liberty Benton, Coldwater and Huron. We got Tenora at Elmwood and Oak Harbor at Eastwood. That Liberty Center, I tell you what, I was at the game last week when they took on Port Clinton. If you remember, Port Clinton went on a nice long playoff run last year. A bunch of seniors and talented players graduated from that roster, but still Port Clinton, a, a valid program, even with the new head coach. But Liberty Center, man, they do not mess around. They scored 40-plus points in the first half. Uh, the offense was just clicking. Their defense is giving up roughly a touchdown, a single touchdown a game. Uh, they are the number one seed and a top-five team in the state for a reason. Yeah, when you do this for 12 weeks, you really pick up on for who's for real. And, and Liberty Center has blown out some really good football teams this year. So – and, you know, nobody scores many points on them. So, obviously, they're the real deal, and, and they expect to keep going. Their opponent is Liberty Benton. I've also seen them in action, and they have a high-scoring, potent offense. They like to throw it around the yard quite a bit. They put up, I believe, 63, right, against yes. uh, uh, Archbold last week. So, uh, you talk about the lock-tight defense for Liberty Center against a high-flying offense for Liberty Benton. This could be a clash of styles. and in, in these clash of style games, Matt, what tends to be the difference? Would you say a high-flying offense can beat a top-notch defense, or does the defense win out? I, I think in this case, Liberty Center has seen spread offense. You know, okay. they, they, the teams that they've played against, Otsego, some of the other teams that they've been against in that league or you know, similar teams – 
And I think by the time you get to this time of the season, it's athletes against athletes. So uh, I don't think either team's going to surprise the other with what style they play. Um, you know, Liberty Benton lost a few in a row in midseason and kind of looked like this was going to be a tough season for them. They're playing as well as anybody in the area right now. So if there's anybody who can knock off Liberty Center, it would be them. The winner of that game gets the winner of the Huron-Coldwater game. And then the two other matchups that I wanted to dig dig a little deeper into, Elmwood at home against Tenora. We saw a showdown between Elmwood and Eastwood midway through the season. Eastwood pulled out a 49-48 win in that, stopping a two-point conversion late against Elmwood. We could get a rematch, but both of them have to take care of business here in the second round. But Elmwood and Tenora, with their offensive firepower, uh, they have been a formidable team. Their only loss was to Eastwood, and Elmwood lost by one point. So they are clearly deserving of that two seed. I I guarantee both of those teams, Elmwood and Eastwood, are looking forward to having one more shot at each other. But the, the, the opponents, Tenora and Oak Harbor, have both been really good. Um, you know, Oak Harbor is one of those that you know I, I we pick every week, and I've picked against a few times. <laughs> and they burned you, and they have burned me every time. There's a reason that I'm in last right now. But <laughs> you know, obviously, Oak Harbor is playing their best football of the year right now. So those are two great games. Yeah, Tenora is no young pup. They no. have been in 15 postseasons thus far, so they can definitely be a, a challenge for Elmwood, but. That quarterback for Elmwood, Hayden Wickard, and then their running back, Mason Oliver. Oliver's been at it now two years, uh, really, when it comes to delivering productive offense for the Royals. And then on that other side, Oak Harbor, the one of the most fun players to watch is Ja'Kai Hayward. He is just a dynamo offensively. He returns uh, special team kicks and punts as well. And he's those type that type of player that – can change the momentum quickly in a game and then get an avalanche of scoring for your team. When you when you look at statistics, one of the things every week when we make our picks, I, I look for statistics to st- see who stands out. Yep. And he obviously stands out from that team. And then with Oak Harbor, you have a bunch of guys who just do their job and are steady football players and all – all kind of complement each other, and, and they look like a top-to-bottom really good football team. Yeah, what about Eastwood and your knowledge of them with Jerry Rutherford? He was there for a long, long time. He's still there as an assistant coach. But hats off to Craig Rutherford, too, because I think when you're taking over for a legendary coach, that legendary coach happens to be your father, yeah. and then he is still on the sidelines coaching alongside you. It could be some level of pressure along with that, and in Craig's – First year, I believe, he led Eastwood to the state championship game. They came up just short, but they have bridged the gap from one coach to another very, very well at Eastwood. Eastwood always has kids that can run. It is one of those things, somebody that's been around for a long time, how different communities can can churn out a certain kind of athlete, I don't know, but Eastwood always has a top-notch track program. And that always tr- translates to their, you know, they're a wing T style offense uh, in football, and, and they always have running backs, quarterbacks, skilled guys who can really fly. And you see that this year with Booze and, and the the rest of their their offense. And, and Eastwood's always really good defensively. They always got two linebackers who can really play. They're always tough up front. Eastwood kind of churns out that same kind of athlete year in and year out. Yeah, Case Boos, their quarterback, uh, he was a wide receiver last year. He's one of four kids, three boys, and then a a girl in that family. All of them have been awesome for not only Eastwood football, but Eastwood basketball and baseball as well. Uh, Case is definitely fun to watch. He made that uh, two-point conversion stop defensively against uh, East, uh, against Elmwood earlier in the regular season, but that is going to be an interesting game. I can see Eastwood being in a higher scoring game against Oak Harbor in that one. So uh, always looking forward to Region 18 and Division 5 because just so many top-tier teams. Nobody squeaked in with poor 4-6 and six or 3-7 and seven records in this one. To- you look at every team on there, they, they all deserve to be there. Those are all top. Every one of them could win a state championship. Yeah, they have been fantastic. All right, D6, Kerry. We've been following the Blue Devils because they are now on a 26-game winning streak. They went 15-1 and one last year, 15 games in a row after a week one loss. They are now 11-0 and 0 this year. 
and playing like a defending state champion. They'll take on Colonel Crawford, so we'll see what Carey can do there. Uh, Northwestern taking on Columbus Grove. Crestview against Patrick Henry. Wanted to touch on Patrick Henry because they were facing Ottawa Hills last week in a game that I thought could be a pick em matchup. It ended up being PH winning 18-10 to against Ottawa Hills. Lots of uh, athleticism on the field. A lot of good defense as well. We saw some high score or high yardage plays, I guess I could say. Uh, what did you take away from that Patrick Henry and Ottawa Hills matchup? Uh, Patrick Henry... Obviously has a head coach, as does Ottawa Hills, who's been there for years. And when you get to that level, when, you, when you've been to the playoffs, when you've been to postseason, you know what you're doing. It, it just comes down to who plays better that particular week. And obviously, Patrick Henry's kids made enough plays to win that football game. Yeah, you talk about Bill Inselman for Patrick Henry and Chris Harbin for Ottawa Hills. And Patrick Henry coming out of the NWOAL. They're the smallest team in that league, and yet they find ways to win. They kind of have ebbs and flows based on what you were talking about, how communities churn out certain types of athletes each and every year. And then in those smaller schools, sometimes you have years where you got the Jimmies and the Joes, and yep. some years you don't. But they've had a solid roster in 2022. Yep, and they're one of those teams, when you watch them, they're always good up front. They can always knock people off the ball, run downhill, and always really good defensively and playing tight football games. Yeah, Patrick Henry, in, in watching a post-game interview with Bill Inselman, he was talking about the caliber of opponents that they faced, the amount of teams that they played during the regular season that ended up going and making the playoffs beginning in week one, two, three, four, five, six. So in week six, they face Brian, and then on down the list, they face Brian, Wauseon, Liberty Center, Delta, Archbold. So five straight weeks, yeah. they played a team that eventually made it to the postseason, uh, all of them with 500 or better records as they entered last week's first round. So battle tested. I always talk about that because it pays off when you need it in the postseason, when you want to go on these deep playoff runs, and it, it works for PH so far. Yep, obviously that's what's getting where they are right now. All right, uh, Hopewell Loudon, a team, the Chieftains that have done some damage in recent postseason history. They take on Columbian. Uh, they are potentially going on a run. They had a higher seed last year, but a six seed this year going to go on the road to Columbia Station, Columbia. So we'll see how Hopo Loudon can do. Let's flip it over to Division 7. We have Macomb, a recent state champion that a one seed. They have a home game against Pandora Gilboa. We also have Gibsonburg at the bottom of that bracket, a six seed. I know you love yourself some uh, running back Connor Smith there from Gibsonburg. They're taking on the three-seed Waynesfield Goshen. So let's start with Gibsonburg, a six-seed, a team that we have seen throughout the year. Yeah, it, when you get to the, the Division Seven kind of teams, when they've got the best player on the field, it really sticks out. And, and you're talking about a kid that could possibly put himself over 3,000 yards rushing and is also the best defensive player on the field. From what I understand, he's as good a linebacker as, as he is a running back. So star power wins in those games. And I think Gibsonburg has the best player probably in that bracket right now. Also a wrestling state champion and looking at Gibsonburg's season thus far they're nine and two they're two losses to ottawa hills a playoff team and to hopo allowed a team that we just talked about so his grandfather was a consensus all-american oh. offensive lineman at ohio state played for woody hayes terrible teddy smith so oh, wow he's uh he's obviously got the bloodlines all right so good luck to gibsonburg see if they can pull a six three seed update there and then Macomb, their head coach Chris Algie, been there for a number of years. I was at the state championship game in Canton a few years ago when they won it all. They're taking on Pandora Gilboa, and this is a matchup in which these teams have met during the regular season. Macomb won by just a single touchdown, 35 to 28, and that game was at Pandora Gilboa. Macomb will have the home field advantage this time around. I, th I think this is probably one of those matchups where home field advantage means something. You know, two really, you know, well matched teams. You really don't see a weakness in either. So you know, Macomb has the the advantage having home field advantage, and you know, Chris Algie's been around forever. He's one of the best coaches in Northwest Ohio. I expect them to do really well. Yeah, Macomb has been in now 26 postseasons. They're 34 and 23 all time. So based on that statistic, 
not only do they get to the postseason, they win a solid amount within the postseason. All right, so that is our Ohio matchups. Let's flip it over to Michigan, Matt. And we saw Bedford come up with a huge win last week against Farmington, so they advanced to take on Livonia Franklin. The interesting element of this one is it's a rematch. These two teams played in the last year's postseason, but not in the second round like this year. They played in the first round last year, and Bedford lost. And I remember doing a preseason team preview with the Kick and Mules and they were using that first-round loss last year as fuel for this season. When you've spent some time around a team like we have with Bedford this year, they seem like that kind of team that they find something every week that somebody did to make them mad a year ago, <laughs> yeah. and they're going to make you pay for it. And, and I've just been impressed with, you know, not numbers-wise, the biggest team you've ever seen. They've got some really good athletes, but they seem to bring it every week and, and be a really tough, hard-nosed football team. And you know that wins when you get in the state playoffs. Yeah, Bedford has challenged some of the top teams in the state. They had Dexter come to Temperance to take on Bedford. We were there for the tailgate show, and we saw some top-tier athletes. Dexter's running back getting recruited to go to Michigan. I know that Mike Hart just played a – visits the running backs coach for Michigan just went to a Dexter game not too long ago so that type of talent is what Bedford has seen and then right after that game in which they lost to Dexter they played Celine and got a victory seven yeah. nothing so yeah. we've seen him explosive on offense and then we've seen him on a lockdown defensive side too yeah uh, coach O'Brien you know, the defensive coordinator at Bedford he's been doing this for years and obviously if you can shut down Celine you can shut down anybody in the state so if you're that good defensively, you can win. I think those those games are, are really what coaches, and you speak to this, where you can say in week 12 that we're in now, you can say, hey, guys, remember back in week six, if you have any doubt, don't have that doubt. We have proven on the field that we can challenge and we can win these types of games. Yeah, you've played against the best running back in the state of Michigan. You've played against one of the top spread offenses in the state of Michigan. You've seen everything you're going to see. Now just go out and play. And who has the best hair in Southeast Michigan? Brueggemann. Trey Brueggemann, yeah. the running back, the flowing locks. Score a touchdown for us. I'll say your name on the air on uh, Friday. That'd be great. Absolutely. All right. Uh, and Division 8, Whiteford. Whiteford has been there, done that, but now they're been there and doing that with the new head coach and Todd Thiekin. Jason Mensing was there for a decade plus, won a state title in 2017, had 10 win seasons year after year after year. Whiteford's at it again. They're 10 and 0 this year, 9 and 0 regular season in Michigan. They only played nine regular season games instead of 10, so they've won their first round game. They're taking on Gabriel Richard here in the second round. That game will be at Whiteford. I'm told if they win. Whiteford wins. They'll play another home game next week, but this game also is going to be a BCSN Now app game live at 7 o'clock on Friday night. But Whiteford has been impressive, to say the least, Matt. Yeah, just a huge win streak right now. I forget how many regular season games in a row that they've won, but just a, a winning program. They know how to win. They know how to win week in and week out. Um, but two teams that scored a lot of points last week and won in blowouts – but it's really hard to pick against Whiteford when you know what they do every week of the season, every year. Yeah, and that offense, you know, just watching when I'm calling highlights and looking at video, you never really know who's going to have the ball. No. And when you're behind that offensive line as a defensive player looking and you've got three guys going in the same direction or three guys going in different directions – and then sometimes they pass, and then sometimes it's a run to the right, sometimes it's a reverse. I mean, it is a tricky, tricky offense to prepare for. They've got the Ruddy brothers. They seem to be really good football players, um, seem to be really tough up front, and they play in the Enchanted Forest. And, uh, how can you how can It is you a not great win? venue. It is a great venue up there. It's really fun. The players come literally come through a forest, a gravel track from the school to the field. It's not big by any stretch of the imagination. No. Obviously, they're a Division Eight team, so a smaller school, but they have a dedicated, loyal fan base, and they have given them – 
a team to be proud of in that community. Mike Jewell lit up a couple weeks ago when he was talking about the Enchanted Forest and how that's his favorite place to watch a football game in the area. And I've never been there. And he, he was beside himself that I've never been there before. So that place must be something. It is. You should get up there to Ottawa Lake. Okay. All right. Um, we're going to circle back to the game of the week in just a second. That's Olmstead Falls at Anthony Wayne. But uh, mention of the student review uh, for you guys. It's time for the BCSN Nation Podcast Student Section Review. Send us your photos or videos of your school student section using the at BCSN Sports and hashtag SSOTW on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. We have six schools remaining for the student section of the season. Central Catholic, Clay, Maumee, Ottawa Hills, Perrysburg, and Whitmer. So those six schools are vying for the student section of the season. We see all the signs and social media posts, hashtag SSOTW, and we want the belt. We've displayed that belt 10 weeks in the regular season. We will crown a champion here in the coming days. So hats off to all the student sections out there, especially those six schools who were honored with student section of the weeks throughout the fall. TikTok, check us out at BCSN Sports, at BCSN Sports. We have hit 5,000 followers. Our next target milestone is 10,000 followers. So keep us locked in on TikTok. And one more topic here, that Olmstead-Anthony Wayne game. Uh, we've seen Anthony Wayne go through the trials and tribulations of injuries. They were on their third or fourth string quarterback for a number of weeks. They do have Grant Kinney back, who was their original sophomore starting quarterback. He pretty much is a run-focused quarterback, at least in the games that he has played thus far. Limited passing attack when he is in the game, but he is back and as close I'll be heading out to Anthony Wayne later this week to see an update on the status report of them. But you, you want as many healthy bodies as possible and to have Grant Kinney, your original starter from back in August, under center or taking shotgun snaps here in the second round of the playoffs, a welcome sight for Brungard. Obviously, when they do have to throw the ball, he's going to be their best bet to throw it. And, and the further along you go, you're going to have to throw it some. You, and they've got a 2,000-yard rusher. Obviously, they don't have to a whole lot. But I'm, I'm sure it's great to have that to fall back on, that all right, now we're back to having a, a guy that can get the ball out there and run some RPOs and throw the ball downfield a little bit and be able to control things a little bit with that. One, one more question about a local matchup, because obviously Anthony Wayne taking on Olmstead Falls. Olmstead Falls played an area team, St. John's, last week. With the use of video and huddle.com and exchanging, do coaches in the same area – do they want to help each other out? Basically, am I getting at it? Would Andy Brungard pick up the phone and call Larry McDaniel at St. John's? Without a doubt, and it, it's an unwritten rule. You, you don't say anything about it, but especially coaches in your league, they'll do everything they can to get you filmed, to get you information, you know, breakdowns, anything they can to help you out, and it's always been that way. Okay. All right. Well, we will elaborate on that Olmstead Falls Anthony Wayne game on Friday at 6:30 live on BCSN. Matt and I will be joined by Pat Charter. We'll be breaking down that matchup live on BCSN's Game Day Tailgate leading into kickoff on BCSN Now app. So in the postseason, OHSA rules prohibit us from showing live TV games, but we can stream them. So that game will be a stream alongside the following games. The list right here. Olmstead Falls, Anthony Wayne, Avon Lake at Central Catholic, Olentangy Berlin at Perrysburg, Holgate at Toledo Christian at Bowling Green High School. That Holgate-Toledo Christian game is the Northern 8 Conference, so that's eight-man football, their league championship game. So it's great for them that they've gotten to the point in which that eight-man football has a league championship, a postseason for those teams to compete in and vie for a championship. Toledo Christian has been dominant within that eight-man league, so congrats to them. We'll see if they can pull out a win against Holgate. We also have the Whiteford game at home against Gabriel Richard, and then three BCSN Erie Sandusky market games that you can get live on the BCSN now at Van Wert at Perkins, Bellevue at Cleveland Glenville, and Huron at Coldwater. So we have highlights of all those games on Friday as well on Game Day Nation Overtime, 13 ABC's Football Friday as well. So we're looking forward to round two of the postseason. For Matt, I am Pat. Thank you for watching BCSN's Nation Podcast on 
listening on your app or watching us online. Thank you so much. As always, we are powered by Marco's Pizza. We'll see you next week.